Good morning, everybody. Dr. Goss here. Um, I my t-shirt hat, but it's a weekend. Uh, so this is for HCM 245, Introduction to Healthcare Business. And we are going to pick up on our overview of how marketing works. And um, we are going to start where we left off, which was um, we, we left off. Now back this slide up just a bit, just to, to, to remind you where we had just gone over, finished up objective three, and I introduced some basic uh, terminology to you, the integrated marketing communication, and then that Marcom marketing communication, which is just that general communication regarding your, your marketing program. And so we are gonna pick it up here with explaining uh, a product positioning. Some of you are going to see me pause a few times. It's really because my, my desk and my home office is a little bit cluttered, unfortunately. Um, so product position uh, in objective four, uh, determining our product's position is a vital step in deciding how, uh, to, how to market our, our product or service. Um, and we have to figure out how, we have to decide how it fills a need that is distinct from the competition. And what makes it a better choice? is our real question here. And so we, I gave you that, that uh, you know, I just picked the hospitals that are near me. Uh, we have two UMass hospitals and one is the uh, teaching, the major teaching hospital connected to the medical school. And one is the uh, St. Vincent Medical Center. And we have to, in order for St. Vincent uh, to compete with them uh, or that for them to compete with St. Vincent and with each other, um, we have to answer this, they have to answer this question, what makes them a better choice? My writing is terrible, but uh, you're used to that by now. So what makes them a better choice? And so one of the ways that we can answer this question uh, for ourselves really before we market it is to do a product positioning. And this is really just a perceptual map that uses our two most important attributes. And we place them on the X and the Y axis, axes. And, um, and so we might choose things such as, are we competing on price? So our two most uh, important attributes, I'll let you know in advance that, uh, not, that others use more than two attributes which I think really makes things complicated. So you probably should make more than one perceptual map, but you'll see an example of it. It seems, it seems to work for it, okay, um, on the next slide. So we look at price. How are we when it comes to price or the quality uh, that we offer compared to our competitors? And so you look at, you look at metrics from things like the Cleveland Clinic and other uh, major uh, hospital uh, systems, you'll see that they publish things such as outcomes, uh, you know, or, or infection rates and things like that, things that informed customers really want to know. Or maybe if it's not price and quality, it's going to be stats. Why do you buy an Apple computer? Or why do you buy an iPhone? If you don't use many of the features, why, why do you feel you need the iPhone? Or why do you buy a certain brand name? Sometimes it's just a status symbol. Or it may simply be the features. You may, it may be status and features. You may, it may be all of these, price, quality, status, and features. You may say, hey, I really like the camera, my, my iPhone 15 or whatever it is. And this, these, it has features that the, that the competition simply doesn't have. Or, and healthcare and others, you may say safety. That's where those publications of, of uh, outcomes really matters. People want to go to healthcare uh, organizations and receive health services that they know are safe, where the risks are low, uh, or perhaps it's reliability. You can see we can go on and we can start to identify those attributes of our service or product um, that we want to compete on. And we may make multiple uh, position maps. So a product position map is really just a tool we use to help 
uh, determine how we want to position our product or service. And so here's some examples. Here's one from awware.co.blog, uh, product positioning. And they use the example of uh, this perceptual map. Again, perception is key um, for athletic footwear. And they choose more than one, um, uh, one attribute. So they use cost. They use, uh, you know, is it expensive? Is it cheap? Uh, do they do it on performance or they do it based on on fashion? And so uh, technically not necessarily more than one attribute because these really could be part of the same attribute. Uh, just how you how you conceive of it. Uh, you know, here is it more expensive or is it less expensive? Is it cheap? Uh, is it more for functionality or less? Uh, more for functionality here or less for functionality and more for appearance. Uh, but here we give the basic product positioning map, you know, price, is it high or is it low? The quality, is it good or is it poor? You know, so how do we compare? Um, so if we have company, you know, somebody offers a service like ours, are they down here, another one here, another one here, and then you have us, you know, here, they're more on the poor quality side. Uh, but they're super, they're far more expensive than us. So we have an edge where we can, we can grab that, that we can latch onto it and, and put it before our customers so that they can decide for themselves. Um, and then uh, here Z is so much more expensive and their quality is only slightly better. But, you know, comparison, this little gap here and this gap, we can exploit those gaps. Uh, so their quality is not so much better as to, uh, to, uh, really justify the cost. And so you see how we can exploit the gaps that we identify in our product positioning maps. And here we have a hospital, regional hospital versus local hospital. So here the, the attribute is really geographic or this location. And responsiveness to the patients. There's so responsive care versus non-responsive care again. Uh, Hospital B and D uh, can compete based on identifying the gaps, and then using that uh, that positioning map. Also, we can use that to improve our services. So, moving on, so we have basically four positioning strategies that we that we want to look at. Um, you know, first off, attractive price and good functional quality. So we can position based on price. And there's more than this, but these are the ones I'm going to go over just put before you so you can start to think about it. Because again, it's an overview of marketing. Um, uh, perceived quality superiority. So we're doing it based on quality. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I totally messed up here. All right, it was early in the morning, so I was thinking something wasn't looking right, so I had to, <laughs> to re, uh, go back and um, uh, and erase those. So here we go. So strike those from your record. Uh, we're going to look at uh, look at the value strategy, and this is really important for us in healthcare. And you know, good old uh, Harvard's uh, Dr. Porter, um, you know, asked this question: What is value in healthcare? In his article that came out in the Harvard Business Review. And uh, it's really not different, and uh, no different than value in, in any other consideration for uh, for a product or a service. Uh, value in healthcare, just like anything else, uh, looks at, um, in healthcare, it looks at outcomes over the price, the price tag, which includes how much does it cost to deliver the care? And uh, so cost to us and to the patient. Uh, so cost to us and cost to the patient. Um, it, it, it addresses all, all of the factors that go that influence that. And then outcomes, it's not just simply, you know, whether or not the patient feels right about it. You know, is it a medically good outcome from a medical standpoint? So I'm just introducing this concept of value in healthcare. Um, and also, you know, we want to consider patient satisfaction. How, how satisfied is the patient with the experience? 
um, and how satisfied are, are their are their family members? Remember, uh, PT is how we abbreviate uh, patient. So experience uh, and then their family's experience. And so there's a whole lot of other, this is just an overview, a whole, a whole lot of other factors that go into that. Um, so, you know, is it an attractive price with good quality? And then we look at quality. So quality was correct. I didn't do that. I just knew there's something missing, something wrong with that first one. So do we have a quality superiority? And then what about demographic, uh, our position of, uh, to appeal to a particular market segment? So we have that demographic uh, positioning strategy. And if you recall, we spoke about uh, the most expensive uh, zip codes in uh, the United States and how uh, Weston, Massachusetts was one of them. And so I, I asked the question about uh, the OPGYN office opening up you know, who are they looking at in this very expensive area uh, and how they're going to be a little bit different in their marketing strategy than others. Um, and then there's a competitive strategy. If we have similar quality and features, uh, just similar to our, our competitors, then what we do is we compete on price. We depend on price to really help make us more competitive. Um, so again, these are just four of uh, many you can choose uh, value, quality, demographic, and competitive uh, marketing strategies. And we have to look at value and healthcare uh, diff slightly differently than, uh, than others. It's very much the same, but we have different factors that go into it. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, the product, the Blue Ocean Strategy which really speaks to this is that you've heard me talk about it. We heard me talk about Cirque du Soleil. Um, and now you can see the Harvard Business Review uh, explainer uh, on, on it. It's only two minutes. In 1984, Guy Le Liberté co-founded Cirque du Soleil. Soon Cirque was bringing in revenues that incumbents like Ringling Brothers had taken more than a century to attain, even though the circus business was in long-term decline. How did Cirque thrive in such a dismal environment? The answer can be found in the theory that the business universe consists of two kinds of markets, red oceans and blue oceans, a concept pioneered by INSEAD professors W. Chan Kim and René Beauborn. Red oceans represent existing industries and markets, where industry boundaries and the rules of competition are well defined. Companies strive to outperform rivals and grab a bigger share of existing demand. As the space gets crowded, fierce competition turns the water bloody. Competitive or market competing strategy is about how to occupy red oceans. By contrast, blue ocean or market creating strategy is about how to create and capture unknown markets where demand is created rather than fought over. In some cases, this spawns entirely new industries. But most blue oceans emerge when a company alters the boundaries of an existing industry, as when Cirque du Soleil blurred the line between circus and theater. Cirque made the acts more artistic and sophisticated, attracting a whole new group of customers, adults who are prepared to pay premium ticket prices as they would for the theater or the opera. Cirque also eliminated several elements of the traditional circus like costly animal acts and star performers. Cirque invented a new and profitable market space without making the typical trade-off between value and cost. Cirque pursued both differentiation and low cost in what Kim and Moborn call value innovation. The simultaneous pursuit of value and cost is the logic of blue ocean strategy. Based on their study of more than 30 industries, companies that can create blue oceans usually reap the benefits for 10 to 15 years because they are hard for rivals to copy. To realize blue ocean potential like Cirque did, companies should chart a strategic course past traditional industry boundaries to create new market space. Well, I think that's a great little explainer uh, about positioning and creating a new space uh, for, your, uh, for your business. So now this gives me an opportunity though to talk about um, sustaining and disruptive innovation uh, in healthcare. And so this is how I see it. Um, sustaining innovation is something that keeps you in that red ocean. 
the sustaining innovation, this example here, and it's a great example of it, is just the Da Vinci robot. By intuitive, um, Da Vinci surgical robot. When it came out, it lacked, I don't know if it has haptic feedback now, but it lacked haptic feedback. Uh, you know, and haptic feedback is what you experience when you are um, playing a video game and you get the, the feeling, the vibration back and the, you, you get to sense where you are. Um, and this surgical robot was state-of-the-art technology at, at its time, and it was very expensive. It was in the millions of dollars. And what it did is it increased the cost of the types of surgeries that it was used for. Why? Uh, because the surgical instruments cost, well, depending on the on the uh, your service contract, was between two thousand to three thousand. And so this is not in your uh, your you, you may you'll have noticed that this is not in your handout. Uh, this is just an opportunity for me to uh, to expand just a little bit further on the blue ocean strategy and also product uh, on positioning product and services. Um, so it increased the cost. It's a sustaining innovation because it sustains how we do things. It makes how we do things more expensive because it's an innovation designed to increase our income, but it doesn't really do much uh, for uh, for our, our customers, uh, our consumers. And so, uh, again, it increased cost, the cost of the surgical instruments, not to mention the robot itself. Um, and then some hospitals purchased it, even though they didn't need it. They didn't. They purchased it because that is how they were attracting the new surgeons. Newer surgeons were saying, "Hey, I want to work with the latest technology." So there was a CEO from a rural hospital who said, "I don't care how much it costs. We're going to get it because it's the only way we can keep offering uh, we can uh, our surgical services." And so they took it at, at a significant loss to them. And then, you know, the problem with technology is there's always new technology around the corner that's even better. And they spent this ton of money uh, and it became quickly uh, obsolete. And I can give you, I can compare this to a disruptive innovation. You know, here is CVS Health starting its Minute Clinic or the Pill Pack, which was started, uh, an innovation that started right here at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Um, a disruptive innovation disrupts how we do things. Uh, we can look also at Zipline, not Zipline Recruiter, but it's the, they uh, use uh, drones to deliver blood products uh, and deliver, I believe, pharmaceuticals. They're in the pharmaceutical business now. Um, so we could see, you know, it, as we position ourselves, you know, are we being disruptive or are we just simply sustaining uh, the status quo? That was just taking it a step further. Um, and so uh, also taking it just another step further, uh, but also not in your uh, in your handout, uh, but, you know, just something for us to think about. UC Davis School of Management, uh, the Dean, uh, Kimberly uh, Elsbach, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, this is an Applegate and Carlson. It's innovation entrepreneurship. You can get that at Harvard Business uh, Publishing. Uh, said that coming up with creative ideas is easy, but selling them to strangers is hard. Uh, so we really have to think hard, long and hard about our product positioning. Uh, so really success and launch, and I should put sustaining a business, I apologize for that. So and launch and sustaining a business uh, depends largely on our ability to communicate the problem. And remember when we spoke about the problem um, that we're solving and why our idea represents a persuasive argument uh, for solving the problem. All right, so to, from there now, hopefully that was helpful by adding that. And oops, not too sure. This stuff open right back up for us. Okay, so now this is from productplan.com. Uh, I just liked their, their, their illustration. And so now moving on to objective five, project product life cycle. I like this because it combines the goal and basically the, the, the management role in a product or service life cycle. And so here I'm going to do a little tiny graph over here. 
hopefully this will make sense. So we can just see this over time. I'm glad I gave myself room. Um, and we introduce our, our product. So let's just call this, call this uh, it's growth. We introduce a product. We introduce a product at time zero when really nobody's using it. Maybe some are because we put out prototypes, et cetera. It's our utilization. So we can call this utilization also. Um, and so we introduce it and your role is basically to get it to, to, to figure out that product market fit, figure out what problem we're solving and communicating that well. Um, and so then we enter this pro area that we call the introductory, the introduction phase of the product lifecycle. I'm just going to represent that by an I. So we have phase one. So these are our phases of the product lifecycle. Introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. And then all of a sudden, hopefully, we see it start to grow. So we see this new phase here, the growth phase. And at some point, so our goal is to expand the reach, to scale, to stay competitive, to really push out our competition. And so we want to get more users and we op want to optimize and accelerate growth as managers. And then at some point we start to plateau and we're drawing just a little tiny line here so you can see that where we start to plateau. So we separate our, our, our phases here. And so we have our plateau and that is where we are retaining it. It's retention, the retention phase, maturity phase. Uh, I'll put M right here in parentheses. And then at some point, the product begins to decline for some reason. So in retention, our goal is to retain it. We want to sustain market share. So I'm writing for sustain market share, and that is our big goal. Um, and so you have two mature products out there. Not a whole lot of others really solving the problem as well. And so we just want to keep competing. And sometimes our goal is uh, merely to retain our share of the market to have predictability. And then at some point after maturity, we need to make decisions on outcomes. And uh, this is this phase, which is the decline phase. And we start to see it going down and maybe rather than seeing it go to zero, we want to extend the usage. You know who's really good at this? WD-40, uh, for right guard, believe it or not, right guard is that golden can of spray. <laughs> it's a deodorant, but we started advertising it for cleaning. Uh, in the military, we used it for cleaning boot stuff off of the tile. Um, and so you find other uses uh, for, for products, but we really have to think strategically about pivoting or do we resurrect current offerings or do we simply phase out uh, a product or a service? Um, so, you know, we can illustrate it this way, you know, do we sustain it uh, or we just, just, just decide to let it die? And so are, you know, we're solution seekers at that point. So thank you to productplan.com. I don't have any sponsors in any of this. So I'm just making sure, you know, that's clear. Uh, it's just, these are uh, uh, things that, you know, I come across that, uh, that I like, and I think they're useful for education. And so hopefully that makes sense. You know, our utilization, uh, which is time, uh, and then, you know, what happens here and how we can conceptualize it. So we have our phases of the product life cycle. You want to get familiar with those, introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. Uh, Professor Cargill will go over that in much greater detail in your semester, whole semester one course on, on marketing. All right, oops. Golly. Oh, I keep hitting escape as opposed to just advancing to the next slide. So here we go. So now we're gonna differentiate between inbound and outbound marketing. It's objective number six. And so I'm going to define outbound marketing for you. This is the one you're, you're most familiar with.
This is sending out the message. So take for take a moment and think about how many messages you've been exposed to in outbound marketing in the way of commercials. So so think about think about them before I give them to you. Just take ten seconds. I'll just write commercials because I already said it. How do how do providers of products and services reach you? Do you know that you're exposed to over 2,000 uh, outbound marketing messages per day? Um, just think about, do you watch YouTube? Do you see all of the commercials that come on? Uh, do you watch TV? Do you uh, turn on the radio? So you're, you're exposed to commercials all the time. So these might be commercials. Do you get unwanted phone calls, the most annoying kind, right? Uh, do you get spam emails? Uh, do you do you do you, are you cold called periodically? Um, the most annoying and expensive uh, kind of outbound marketing. Um, and we really have to rethink how we do things, right? Because uh, people don't want it. And I'm if I'm annoyed <laughs> by you, I am. Less, I don't know about you, but if I'm annoyed by them, I'm less likely to use their product. Um, I, I think they're slowly catching on. And, you know, we, we've done things. And you'll see in this video, I'm about to show you, you know, the, the, the phases we've gone through just to try to eliminate this altogether. We get our emails. We hit report to spam. Uh, we block calls. Eventually, artificial intelligence is going to know our preferences and eventually just not let in those uh, uh, terrible calls. So outbound marketing is, how, you know, how do we send out the message? And we really have to consider our return on investment. So for those of you who do not know what that means, return on investment, uh, ROI, return on investment, um, is how much do we get back? We're going to put money into commercials. We want it to generate revenue. We want it to generate more revenue uh, than it costs us. So we need a return on that investment. Our investment is into the commercial, and we want a better return. All right, so now let's look at inbound marketing. How is it different? Again, no sponsors, but I will tell you, we want to generate interest. Um, I will tell you about, you've, you've seen me using my Remarkable. I tell you, I've had it since this, uh, April, and it has been one of the best things I have in many. You see me writing in it, you see me carrying it around, uh, and I, I use it on the train uh, during my commute, and it's made my travel lighter because I don't carry on a whole bunch of papers anymore. Um, and a lot of people have asked me about it. And so inbound marketing is meant to generate interest. Some prof other professors have asked me about it. Uh, students have asked me about it. Commuters on the train have asked me about it because I get in a lot of conversations because I'm, I'm a professional guy. Uh, and so in generating this interest, people come to us. So come to Remarkable. So I say come to us because that's what we want. We want to generate interest to get people to come to us. Um, to come to our website. To, to, to learn more. We want our people talking about us. Uh, we want people to say, after they experience our services at a healthcare organization, to go and say, you know, you really should go to Dr. So-and-so or go to uh, uh, that healthcare organization because they really care and they do really great service. Maybe the environment is great. Um, there's a lot of things about it that, that helps generate that, uh, that interest. So really, that's what inbound marketing is about. It's about generating uh, interest to get people to come to us to learn more, uh, visit our website. To call us. To explore. Explore our products and services.
So let's learn about more about that from this this video here. I think it's very informative, very helpful video. And this is from HubSpot. Help people understand what the difference between inbound and outbound marketing is. Most, the heart of most marketing is interrupting people. Uh, it's interrupting people with an email while they're at work, with a cold call uh, on their phone, with an ad while they're watching their favorite TV show. Oops. help people understand what the difference between inbound and outbound marketing is? Most, the heart of most marketing is interrupting people. Uh, it's interrupting people with an email while they're at work, with a cold call uh, on their phone, with an ad while they're watching their favorite TV show, an ad on the radio. So it's anything. irritating. Billboards. Everything. Print ads. Yeah. TV it's, spots. And what they're doing is essentially, what hap what's happened in sort of society is somebody builds up some traffic, whether it's a highway, or it's a radio show or TV show, and you rent a little spit piece of their traffic. Yeah. And that's just working less and less well. People are getting, their tolerance for that interruption has gone down, yeah. and their ability to block it's gone way up. And why do you think that is? Is it because we're desensitized? Is it because we're so busy? We don't care? What, what is it? I think we're so busy, that, but I think there's new technology that helps you block it out. Like, let's take email. Um, spam protection was sort of one nail in the coffin, but the bigger nail in the coffin is Gmail now gives you the ability to sort of separate out all those one-to-many emails. That's a yeah. That's another whopper nail. It's just going to get harder and harder. With phone calls, the first nail in the coffin was caller ID. Um, the second nail in the coffin, I think what will happen with spam protection will happen with phone calls. So you'll be able to say mark as spam if someone calls you and it's spam, and there'll be a spam list and that will get harder. And I think the other nail, in the, the last nail in the coffin was less and less people, people hate to talk on the phone, I hate to talk on the phone. I don't have a phone on my desk anymore. Um, most of the decks don't have a phone on their desks anymore. I just think technology's enabled us to block out mar irritating marketing uh, in ever and ever yeah. more efficient ways. So your solution is in, inbound marketing? Yeah. So what is that? Sort of the opposite. Instead of trying to interrupt somebody while they're doing their work, how do you how do you tr how do you pull them in? How do you pull them in while they're working? How do you how do you match the way you market with the way a human actually lives and works and shops and learns? And so, uh, our solution is much more around the, the the cost to develop a piece of content. It used to be very expensive to create a TV show or very expensive to create a radio. I want to pause it because I just want to point out something you just said. How do you match your marketing to the way people actually live, work, and learn? Really important a show or a newspaper or anything, boy, the cost to create content has is, is really dropped a lot, 10, 100x. And so what we say is don't rent a piece of content on somebody else's traffic. You know, build your own piece of content. Build your own traffic and rent space to yourself, essentially. So mm -hmm. the cost to develop content's drop. Take advantage of that cost and build your own traffic in a new way. And if you create good content, good content, ten, people tend to find good content. It's like a magnet. So if you've got a good blog or you've got a good uh, show on YouTube or if you've got a good ebook or you've got a good piece of any type of content, it turns into a magnet and people end up finding it. The, in the internet's very efficient at following people towards great content. So what are some of the downsides? Because when I think about this, you know, building an audience, and we did this with the show, yeah. um, we focused on great content, but um, it takes time, doesn't it? To build that audience? That, that's the, that's the, the rub on it. Um, traditional marketing is about the width of your, your wallet. This new marketing is about the width of your brain. Um, you don't need a lot of money to create content today to start a show like you've started or to start a blog or start anything today. It's the cost has dropped dramatically. But you need to be clever and smart and it takes a little bit of time. And so for your show, you have to take time and you have to have to get on reasonable guests, and you have to ask good questions, and you have to keep it compelling, and you have to become a good editor. None of which costs a lot of money, but it costs your time and energy. Yeah. Um, that, that's the hard part, is it takes a little bit of time, but um, boy, it pays off in spades. All right, great. I think that was a very helpful, helpful interview. All right, so. All right, so this now brings us to objective seven, your final objective. Now, I do want to point out that you do not have to, um, this. you'll see a note space on your handout. 
and I don't need to see complete notes on this. Uh, what I'm looking at is every all of the fill in the blanks that came above. Uh, but that does not mean that it's not quizzable, because it is. And it doesn't mean you won't get conceptual questions regarding it, uh, because you will. Uh, but uh, this is just means I did not create fill in the blanks for it, because this really is just an overview of the general principles of marketing. But I've been inserting healthcare all the way through because I really need you to start thinking about this, all of these business topics that we talk about in terms of healthcare business. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. So um, here we are with objective number seven. You know, how really is marketing in healthcare different from other forms of business? So marketing is important for all forms of business, right? And so we really have to figure out how do we get it into people's lives so they're thinking about the organization. So they're thinking about the service, so they're thinking about the organization, so they're thinking about uh, uh, the product. And so we use the same processes as used by non-healthcare businesses, but there are some different uh, considerations, some very important considerations. Um, you know, just like any other business, uh, we want a good marketing strategy helps us reach new customers. Numbers, remember the difference between them. And here we say just we're translating that into reaching new uh, patients. And we want to guide patients through the healthcare journey. Um, and we have to remember that our business is really health and wellness. It's not necessarily that specific service of defining our business when we spoke about you know defining our customers and defining really what our product is we spoke about marketing myopia um and we want to consider the whole of what we do and so healthcare marketing should be thought of as a process of creating communicating and offering health and wellness information And the actual definition really depends on the needs and goals of the organization, but I want to take you to this broadest point uh, possible. Oops. And remember that our target audience is always at the center of our marketing strategy. And it is, people are far more invested uh, in uh, discovering more about a healthcare service than they would necessarily a cell phone, for example. At least I hope they are. Um, so I, I'll ask you this question. Hey, some of you may never have seen a physician before, uh, but think about this. Imagine sending a person, uh, either for yourself or, or a loved one, how would you go about selecting a physician? Let's just say you don't have a private practice physician right now, a general practitioner, and how would you go about finding one? Do you just randomly pick one out of the phone book? Well, some people might. That's probably not all that wise. Uh, or do you perhaps look at the different reviews? And in those reviews, what are the things that you consider? Or do you perhaps consider uh, the commentary on how attentive they are to your needs? How much time they're willing to spend with you? Uh, think about all of these things. You know, whether or not the person seems to care. Caring is, is important. Uh, to, so we're, we're talking about quality. The things we look at are quality. We look at outcomes. So you're thinking about sending a loved one to a physician. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's a sibling. Um, you're not going to just send them to anyone. So do they care? Quality, the outcomes, do they care? Uh, and cost becomes less of a factor for us. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, sometimes cost is not as much of a factor. Not as much of a factor uh, because it's not coming out of our pocket necessarily. Because we have insurance, perhaps third-party payers. So 
So in a regular, like for example, cell phone example, you may use quality or features versus price. But the problem with healthcare, and particularly in the United States um, and in places with universal healthcare, third, third parties are paying for it. So it's less of a factor, but and that's a very important consideration in marketing healthcare. So we really need to consider what our target audience wants and needs from our service, from what we offer. And so this is only a snapshot. The parts of a marketing strategy are similar to other forms of business and not all inclusive. Um, is market research, how we generate leads, the public relations, branding. Branding is hugely important. Um, you want people to be want to be associated with you. So what is different then when it comes to healthcare? Well, in healthcare, products and services are highly regulated. You've heard me emphasize this point again and again throughout the semester so far. We're only in week uh, week four, going into week five. Uh, you know, just examples of it. Uh, you learned learned this in week one. Uh, you know, highly regulated. And examples are Amtala, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, the High Tech Act, Stark Law, Anti Kickback Statutes, and a bunch of others. And I see my terrible, terrible omission where I didn't put the closing uh, piece there. Um, but also because it's very personal. Healthcare is very personal. Just writing that down to underscore that piece. Uh, there's vulnerability involved. The vulnerability of the customer uh, slash consumer and of loved ones. We're not just dealing with the patient. We're dealing with the patient's family as well. Also, yes, some cell phone batteries have caught fire, but the stakes aren't usually high <laughs> when you're talking about cell phones and other things like that. But the stakes are high with healthcare. Healthcare can cause injury. People become ill at hospitals. It's called uh, iatrogenic. Iatrogenic, that's an R. So look that up. The competition is fierce. Healthcare organizations, HCO means a healthcare organization. A lot of them exist in red oceans. And you know what I mean by that. And also we have major privacy concerns. We can't just sell things, sell patient information. Thank goodness we can't, right? Uh, and we must not make promises. Uh, we have to be careful using words such as best or stating things that are not backed by proof because the moment we do and the outcome doesn't match it, we open ourselves up to liability. So you can see a lot is the same as illustrated by this side. But there's a lot more that's different. These are just a few examples. And so how to approach it? And this is what the experts, the consensus is. We we approach it with transparency, especially important for healthcare organizations. We want to keep it personal because healthcare is personal. <laughs> Was there a oh, nice random mark there? Because healthcare is personal, we need to keep it personal. The foot stomp this. Because it's about them. It's about them and it's about their family members. And we need to do it with compassion. And we need to really be trustworthy. I should have put trustworthy underneath transparency because they kind of go to care, they go hand in hand. We really need to focus on the patient experience. Again, tying it to compassion and person, being personal. And then we want to keep our marketing simple. So, in conclusion, Healthcare marketing is in some ways similar to marketing in other forms of business. It's very similar. In other ways, it's very different because we offer health and wellness. And being in the business of providing healthcare, we need to recognize that our clients and their families are vulnerable. Also, the adage, credat emptor, let the buyer believe, uh, is prevalent as opposed to caveat emptor, 
which means let the buyer beware. Let the buyer beware is prevalent in thinking uh, throughout other forms of business, but it can't be prevalent in healthcare. So we use credat inventory. Let the buyer believe. And it, these adages inform us that we must act in good faith, adhere to stringent ethical principles and values, and operate with transparency, especially in how we market and operate our services. All right. So hopefully, again, the most important thing is that you've learned something. I hope that you have learned something. And I will stop this video here, and I will see you all in the classroom. Uh, take care of yourselves and have a wonderful rest of your week.